Hello, my name is Stephen Pratt, and I love America. My desire is to share a series of video segments that cover the great principles of American liberty. Our written constitution is a legally binding contract. To help understand this principle, let's use this simple contract one can purchase at the office supply store. This is a contract between two families to lease a house. It has a preamble. This is a legally binding contract. If not understood, seek competent advice. Following the preamble, it has the parties to the contract. In this case, it's two families. Then comes the agreement. Sometimes we call this the fine print. Followed by the date and the signatures. This makes up a legally binding contract. And as in the preamble, if not understood, seek competent advice. Is the preamble an essential part of this contract? The answer is no. It does not need to be there. It does, has no relevance whatever to the legally binding portions of the contract. Multiple choice question. What kind of a contract is this lease agreement? For example, if the homeowners owned vast acreages of land and are renowned aristocratic citizens, would that make the contract an aristocratic contract? Clearly, the answer is no. What if the homeowners had royal blood and they were making the contract? Would this make it a monarchy contract? And again, the answer is no. Oh, but what if the homeowners called their whole family together and by secret ballot they determined to accept the contract? Would this make it a democratic contract? Again, the answer is no. None of the above. Notice the fine print. In the fine print, we see it says no pets. What is the meaning of this? No pets. Now this raises a serious question. What are the implied powers coming from the phrase no pets? No pets. If you're a liberal, no pets means that no home is complete without pets. Hence, no pets means that all pets are allowed. If you're a conservative, no pets means that no pets are allowed without proper licensing and shots and certainly does not include gerbils, lizards, and snakes. The implied powers of the no pet debate rages on. How many free veterinary services should be provided? What kind of prescription drug programs should be made available? And don't forget the vital importance of no pet left behind. Where should Fannie and Freddie provide low-interest mortgages for dog houses? And how much should we provide for bailout programs when the cat houses come crashing down? If Thomas Jefferson were here today, how would he define no pets? Let us not make it a blank paper by construction. No pets means no pets. The Constitution is a contract. The Constitution has a preamble. It has the parties to the contract, each state named independent of the others. From then on, it refers to the parties in the plural using the word states. It has an agreement, followed by a date, followed by the signatures. Now, there is a difference here. The signatures in this case do not give the Constitution its life. And this Constitution is the definition of the word republic when we say the Pledge of Allegiance, we pledge and to the Republic for which it stands. The Declaration, together with the Constitution, and of course the Bill of Rights, which is part of that document, are more than 6,000 words which define the American Republic. Multiple choice question. What kind of a contract is our Constitution? Aristocratic contract? Monarchical contract? Democratic contract? or none of the above? I submit for your consideration the most accurate answer is none of the above. Dennis Farnsworth, professor of political science at Utah Valley University, was quoted in the newspaper of April the 11th, 2010 as having explained, monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy are each types of republics. The United States began as an aristocratic republic during the days of Andrew Jackson, the aristocratic republic transformed itself into a democratic republic, which is what the United States remains to this day. I ask this question, transformed itself? 
Did the meaning of the words of the contract change during the days of Andrew Jackson? No. What kind of a republic do our founding documents define using more than 6,000 carefully selected words? The best answer, in my opinion, is American Republic. And when we pledge allegiance to the flag, we shorten it just down to that one word and to the republic for which it stands. How the Constitution Developed Deliberation at a Convention of States Verbal Agreement Following verbal agreement, a written contract. Someone needed to write it down. The gentleman that wrote it down was a colorful character. He was the chairman of the Committee on Style. He was the only founding father with a wooden leg. And when other people clapped their hands, he would thump his wooden leg. His name was Gouverneur Morris. It was a compact, an agreement between states. In O. Webster's Dictionary, we learn the word compact was used because it was a contract between states. And then Noah Webster goes on to explain, the compact constitutes our plan of government, and hence it is called the Constitution. This is straight out of Noah Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Compact. At the end of this definition, he states, so the Constitution of the United States is a political contract between the states. When we come back to the official literature of our time, we read, the compact theory was rejected by the framers. This is the official literature. Who are the parties to the contract? In the opening statement of the Constitution, we read the name of each state. From then on, they are referred to as states. I would like them to add this bit to the Constitution if I were going to have an amendment or something to change it. This is a legally binding contract. If not understood, seek competent advice. The word vest is an important word. To furnish with, to invest with, as to vest a man with authority, to clothe with office or power. We find the word vested used in the Constitution several times. For example, Article 1. All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested. The Congress shall, and then it enumerates the powers vested in the Congress. In Article 2 we read, The executive power shall be vested in a president. The president shall, and then it enumerates the vested powers of the president. Article 3, The judicial power shall be vested in courts with such exceptions and under such regulations as the Congress shall make. Vested powers are the same as delegated powers and are quite different from ceded powers. There are no ceded powers in the Constitution, not one. In questions of power, then, let no more be said of confidence in man, but bind him down from mischief by the chains of the Constitution. Or Thomas Jefferson could have said, bind him down from mischief by the chains of the contract. In summary then, our written constitution is a legally binding contract. And because it was a contract between states, it's called a compact. And because the compact constitutes our plan of government, it's called our constitution. If a nation expects to be ignorant and free, they expect what never was and never will be. Many trusted and loved people have come to the recognition that we must know and understand the principles of liberty if we expect to maintain them. We have presented some concepts about the unknown American Republic. Unknown because most Americans do not understand the word republic when they pledge allegiance to the flag. We can change that. If enough people will learn their history and learn the principles of freedom as established by those men whom we call our Founding Fathers. I look forward to reading your comments below. If you like what you have heard, please consider subscribing to this series and sharing this video with your friends. For additional information and resources, visit AmericanLibertyVideo.com.